Thank you for standing by and welcome to Lime Aid Q3 2020 Investor Conference Call. All participants are in a listen-only mode. There will be a presentation followed by a question and answer session. If you wish to ask a question, you will need to press the star key followed by the number 1 on your telephone keypad. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Henry Albridge, CEO. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator, and thank you for joining the call today, everyone. My name is Henry Albrecht, CEO of LimeAid, and I'm here to present an overview of our business activities and cash flow results for the quarter ending 30 October 2020. Joining me today is Toby Davis, LimeAid CFO. Let's start with what's on everyone's mind, COVID-19. The persistence of this virus and pandemic and the effects on the U.S. population and business climate as well as what's going on in Europe with additional rolling shutdowns in parts of Europe, continues to prolong business uncertainty. Overall, our business activity in the U.S. and elsewhere for Limeade has slowed the rate of contract signings in the third quarter, albeit there was an improvement in absolute terms with Q2. If you take the time to visit our website, you'll see the strategic approach we've taken to empower customers, potential or actual, to navigate through the crisis with action plans, activities, and programs. The interest in LimeAid has never been higher as evidenced by our pipeline. Unfortunately, this is a double-edged sword as though the inquiry rate and qualifying pipeline has grown materially since 2019, the execution by way of contracting since March has slowed. During the quarter, the company did experience some customer terminations or non-renewals, churn, with net revenue retention, or NRR, declining from 98% to 93% as at 30 September 2020 versus Q2 2020. As we mentioned in the release, churn was related to the economic pressures of the COVID-19 pandemic and related layoffs, furloughs, and employee experience-related budget cuts. However, the overall level of customer terminations or non-renewals remains within overall company expectations for the nine months of the FY20 financial year. We were pleased to secure a large contract expansion with the global top five technology customer during the period. I'm delighted to report we have reviewed our expectations for the fourth quarter and the full year ended 31 December 2020 and have upgraded our EBITDA and net loss after tax guidance for a second time this year to a forecast EBITDA loss of zero to $2 million, from $5.5 to $6.5 million, and an upgraded net loss after tax of $1.5 to $3.5 million, from 7 to $8 million previously. Our revenue guidance of $56.1 million remains unchanged. Our upgraded financial guidance provided today highlights our strong fiscal discipline in managing the business coupled with the adaptability of the LimeAid operating model, where limitations on more traditional business practices of travel, events, and conferences have manifested since COVID-19. Despite these changes, I'm pleased to report the company's total sales and marketing pipeline at Q3 2020 remains similar to the total pipeline at Q2 2020, which stood at U.S. $219 million. However, as with Q2 2020, during the quarter, line, it continued to experience delays in finalizing both new sales and upsell expansion contracts, reflecting prospect and customer uncertainty related to enterprise budgets due to COVID-19. The fourth quarter will be a crucial one for the company relating to new contract signings, and we are all pushing hard as a team to achieve success. During the quarter and shortly after the close of the quarter, LimeAid made several important executive appointments to strengthen our leadership team. Larry Colagiovanni, who's been the Vice President of Research and Development at LimeAid since March 2020, is being promoted to the role of Chief Technology Officer, or CTO, and Scott Fletcher will assume the role of General Counsel. In addition, LimeAid made two new senior executive appointments with Padmashri Kanetti, appointed VP of Product, and Julie Nyberg, VP of People. These executives bring to Limeade a significant level of senior management experience across the technology sector, including 
stints with eBay, Amazon, and Microsoft, and are a welcome addition to the Line Aid team. On a personal note, I was very proud to be awarded the Entrepreneur of the Year 2020 Pacific Northwest Region Award winner for Lime Aid. I share that honor on behalf of all of our Lime Mates, our excellent employees, for their dedication to our business's success. Before I turn the call over to Toby, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Eric Rivas, Lime Aid co-founder and VP Corporate Development, who retired from the company on 30 September after many years of dedicated service and commitment to Lime Aid. From the days as a small startup to the publicly listed company we are today, on behalf of the board and the employees of Limeade, we recognize his contribution to the business. I will now turn the call over to Toby, who will walk you through the operational and financial highlights for the quarter. Thanks, Toby. Thank you, Henry. During the quarter, Limeade signed an additional three new contracts. These represented two well-being deals and one engagement customer and they came from the financial services, energy, and healthcare sectors, respectively. Overall, Limeade expects an increase in the signing of customer contracts in the fourth quarter over the third quarter of the calendar year, with most services launching the following year, which is consistent with prior years. However, due to continued COVID-19 uncertainty, as mentioned previously by Henry, there's a chance that some of these current contracts negotiating could push into 2021. During the quarter, the company recorded cash receipts from customers of 23.7 million U.S. dollars. Net cash receipts from customers after adjusting for payments made in relation to the sale of third-party products and services was 19 million, up 81% versus Q2 2020. This was due to the seasonal nature of our direct well-being enterprise customers and the schedule of their annual payments. Third-party payments of $4.7 million were down 31% versus Q2 2020 due to a reduction in the demand for one-time purchases of in-person biometric screening events caused and related to COVID-19. Cash payments during the quarter were primarily directed towards the following costs, $9.3 million in staff costs, $2.5 million of administrative and corporate operations of $6 million, $600,000, excuse me, marketing expenses of 700000 and research and development of 200000 Staff costs increased 9.2% over Q2 due to the lower capitalization of software dev costs in Q3 2020. Overall, headcount was lower than prospectus forecasts based on continued scrutiny of hiring associated with the general business uncertainty and activity during the COVID-19 pandemic. Overall, net operating cash inflows for the quarter was $5.7 million, compared to Q2 2020 cash outflows of $2.5 million. This exceeded the company expectation and reflects an accelerated receipt of the annual subscription payment from a large technology customer that included additional user expansions that we collected on. Investors will note from our table of expenditure of IPO funds that we continue to track under our expenditure plan from the funds raised in the IPO on ASX in December 2019, with cumulatively $10.9 million of IPO proceeds invested to date. In the third quarter, sales and marketing, research and development, and general and administrative expenditures were all tracking under plan. As with the second quarter under COVID-19, we saw a reduction in travel expenses, continued to reduce marketing and customer events, holding those in virtual environments, and also slowed down the rate of new hires. The company's headcount at the end of Q3 was 266 versus 275 as at June 2020. The reduction is due to a temporary timing difference between headcount turnover and backfilling the positions. We ended the quarter with a very healthy cap position of 33.5 million through a combination of fiscal discipline and a slowdown in the rate of new hires under COVID-19 due to global uncertainty our cash balance relative to the IPO in December 2019 has actually increased by about 5% in the nine months since becoming a public company. We continue to preserve financial flexibility to execute on our strategy to drive long-term value. As mentioned before, our capital deployment plans also allow us to drive inorganic growth with disciplined strategic acquisitions that complement the Limeade employee experience platform. I'll now turn the call back to Henry. Thanks, Toby. In summary, 
LIMAID continues to weather the storm of uncertainty with COVID-19, and our pipeline remains strong. The fourth quarter for LIMAID will be a busy one for LIMAID as we seek to close new contracts with clients and deliver on our plans. We're also pleased to be delivering a second upgrade to our FY20 guidance in the last six months with a much improved EBITDA and net loss after tax performance for the 2020 financial year versus our previous guidance, with our revenues remaining per previous guidance, despite global uncertainty, which I'm very proud of. I would now like to hand over to the operator for the question and answer session. Thank you all. Thank you. If you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. If you wish to cancel your request, please press star 2. If you're on a speakerphone, please pick up your handset to ask your question. Your first question comes from Seth Hoskins from Canaccord Genuity. Please go ahead. Hey Henry, hey Toby, how's it going guys? Um, just a couple of questions Great. from me. Um, just starting with the uh, net revenue retention number and the churn obviously lifting a little bit, I was just wondering if you could provide any colour in terms of, you know, is it broad base across the customer base or any specific industries, potentially like airlines that were um, materially impacted relative to the others? Well, the first thing I'll say is, is per the report, um, the churn we view as, as COVID-related, macroeconomic pressure-related. And as we reported in the mid-year, about two-thirds of our business is in pretty safe, defensive industries, and about a third of the, the businesses we serve are in more susceptible industries, and I think you mentioned one a mo moment ago. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we saw more churn in the susceptible third uh, than we did in the more defensive third of our business, but overall we're you know, we're pleased that most of our business resides in more uh, stable industries like uh, manufacturing has been, uh, government, education, and technology. Okay. Cool. Yeah, 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 I think I'll, 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 just, I'll just add to that. Sorry. I think when you look at NRR, it's also a combination of churn plus the uh, upsell expansion. And so we're, we're actually, the churn is tracking to what our original forecast is. Uh, it's, it's probably more on the uh, upsell expansion side that's, you know, traditionally kind of bucketed into also the new sale impact that's similar on the, you know, COVID-related fronts. Okay, yeah, that, that makes things just like that, guys. And in terms of the, the M&A strategy, you guys highlighted that you're looking at a number of acquisitions, strategic acquisitions, which could aid in car growth. Could you just talk to, through sort of how you're thinking over the next 12 to 18 months in terms of sort of customer acquisition versus product capability and it has, it has the market for acquisitions in terms of these things and to press valuations and opportunities out there? Yeah, that's uh, it's been a, a real focus of ours to make sure that we're expanding our employee experience platform. So I guess if I had to answer your question about is it customers versus product, it's going to skew more towards product. In our prospectus, we called out several areas of the employee experience that we view as essential to building uh, a culture of connection, engagement, um, communication, et cetera. So um, those, those areas are pretty clearly outlined as adjacent product areas to our core strengths in well-being, engagement, and inclusion. Um, let's see. Uh, I think that it, the economy for acquisitions is interesting. Uh, there, there's there's a wide variety of valuation expectations, and obviously we don't control who says yes or no to our um, statements of interest in acquiring them. And you know, private equity valuations have, are, have still been relatively high in the in the U.S. at least in the tech sector. Um, so I wouldn't say it's a, a no-brainer that we'll get deals done, but we're a absolutely actively pursuing uh, inorganic growth opportunities and. Anything we pursue will be accretive financially, uh, strategically, uh, to our technology and our products, and into our culture as well. Those are the four main filters we use to look at these acquisitions. Okay, cool. Yeah, and just uh, just a couple quick ones from me still. There. And the sales and marketing obviously understand the sort of delaying the, the expansion and that team there. What are kind of the you know, key things that you're looking for before you start to reinvest in that area? Or is it just, you know, general pipeline engagement sort of picking up? 
Yeah, I, th I think our customers and prospects are telling us when they're ready to spend money. And uh, right now, I think that there are still a lot of companies out there, um, on one hand, saying our budgets are frozen and we're laying off thousands and thousands of people. So launching new initiatives, albeit even if they're very important ones, is something that we're not quite ready to do. So that, to me, is not a if, it's a when. And there's still some... Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of uncertainty in the world economy related to COVID pandemic and how it's being handled. Um, so I think that's on one hand. On the other hand, we're also seeing an increase in the pipeline long term where companies are saying, well, whatever we do in the long term, we need to address these long term secular trends of working from home, managing a remote team, showing care and support during times of emotional stress or crisis helping people with financial planning and well-being, et cetera. So I, I think we're still seeing this duality of pausing due to the short-term pandemic effects and increased interest due to the long-term. In fact, uh, without getting too personal, I, I received an email from a, a buyer at a large company today saying, um, I really wish we would have moved forward with you because we've needed you badly for the last six months in this company. So I, I consider that long-term demand. Yeah, actually, cheers. That's, that's really helpful. And then just a final really quick one. Could you sort of provide any color on the usage trends within your existing customer base over the last six months? Are they, you know, picking up given the backdrop with COVID and more work from home, or is it kind of consistent? N nothing really new to add since the mid-year report uh, three months ago. Cool. Thanks, Toby. Thanks, Henry. Cheers, guys. Thank you, Seth. Appreciate it. Thank you. Once again, if you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. Your next question comes from Tim Lawson from Macquarie Group. Please go ahead. Hi, Henry and Toby. Uh, just a question on the pipeline. You've talked about uh, the aggregate size of the pipeline um, remaining relatively stable. Can you talk about how customers are progressing through? I appreciate you've already said that you should expect more signs in the fourth quarter, maybe some pushing to 21, but are we getting the pipeline being effectively closer to conversion uh, in, the, in the last sort of three to six months? Yeah, Tim, thanks for the question. This is Toby. Uh, I think your question really is touching on the velocity. And um, what I'd say is the pipeline is, you know, as, as we've gotten closer through the end of the year, um, you know, some deals have moved through the stages. I think it just becomes the critical phases, some things are falling out, some things then get added back to the top. So, you know, I think where where we look at the bottom two stages of the pipeline, that's actually shaped up pretty nicely, but the question just comes down to timing, uh, kind of to our point of whether, you know, is that, is, are things going to roll over into 2021, or, or will they be booked and closed in, in 2020? That's uh, that's a key question, but, you know, overall, the, the total dollar amount still remains the same. Uh, I'd say maybe things have moved down a little bit further down, but probably not at the velocity that we would expect, you know, outside of COVID. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Once again, if you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. We will pause as we wait for participants to join the queue. There are no further questions at this time. I will now hand back to Mr. Aldrich for closing remarks. Thank you, Operator. Thank you all for joining the call today and for your questions. We look forward to updating the market through the remainder of 2020 on our progress towards our stated objectives. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Operator. Thank you. That does conclude our conference for today. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.